Ranger's Apprentice, Book 2, The Burning Bridge, by John Flanagan. Chapter 15. They rode as hard as they could that night, held back somewhat by the docile pace that was all the pack pony could manage. The rain came back during the night to make them more miserable. But then, an hour before dawn, it cleared, so that the first streaks of light in the east painted the sky a dull pearl color. With the gathering light, Will began to look for a place to make camp. Horace noticed him looking around. Why don't we just keep going for a couple more hours? He suggested. The horses aren't really tired yet. Will hesitated. It seen no sign of anyone else during the night, and certainly no evidence of any walkers in the area. But he didn't like to go against Gillen's advice. In the past, he'd found that advice given by a senior ranger. You surely turned out to be worth following. He hesitated then came to a decision as they rounded the next bend, and saw a thicket of shrubs set back about 30 meters from the road. The bushes, while not more than 3 meters high at their tallest point, offered a thick screen, providing shelter from both the wind and any unfriendly eyes that might chance to come along. We'll camp here, Will said, indicating the bushes. That's the first decent looking campsite we passed in hours. Who knows when we'll see another. Horace shrugged. He was quite content to let Will make the decisions. He had only been making a suggestion, not trying to usurp the ranger princess's authority in any way. Horace was essentially a simple soul. He reacted well to commands and to other people making decisions. Right now, stop here, fight there. As long as he trusted the person making the decisions, he was happy to abide by them. And he trusted Will's judgment. He had a hazy idea. The ranger training somehow made people more decisive and intelligent. And of course, in that he was right, to a large degree. As they dismounted and led their horses through the thick bushes into a clearing beyond, Will gave a small sigh of relief. He was stiffer than he'd realized after a full night in the saddle, with only a few brief rests. Several good hours of sleep seemed like a capital idea right now. He helped Evan lend down from the peggy pony riding on the pack saddle as she had to. It was a little awkward for her to dismount. Then he began unstrapping their packs of food and supplies, and the rolled canvas length that they used as weather shelter. Evelyn, with barely a word to him, stretched, then walked a few paces away to sit down on a flat rock. Will, his forehead creased in a frown, tossed one of the food packs onto the sand at her feet. You can start getting the meal ready. He said more abruptly than he had intended. He was annoyed. The girl would sit down and make herself comfortable, leaving the work to him and Horace. She glanced down at the pack and flushed angrily. I'm not particularly hungry, she told him. Horace started forward from where he was unsettling his horse. I'll do it, he said, keen to avoid any conflict between the other two. But Will had up a hand to stop him. No, I'd like you to rig the shelter. Evelyn can get the food out. His eyes locked with hers. They were both angry, but she realized she was in the wrong. She shrugged faintly and reached for the pack. If it means so much to you, she muttered, then asked, Is it all right if Horace makes the fire for me? He can do it a lot quicker than I. Will considered the idea, screwing up his face thoughtfully. He was reluctant to light a fire while they were still in Celtica. It hardly seemed logical to travel by night to avoid being seen, then light a fire whose smoke might be visible in daylight. Besides... There was another consideration that Gillen had pointed out to him the previous day. No fire, he said decisively, and Evan did tossed the food pack down sulkily. Not cold food again, she snapped. Will regarded her evenly. Not so long ago, you would have been you would happily have eaten anything, hot or cold, as long as it was food, he reminded her, and she dropped her eyes from his look. Look, he added, in a more reasoning tone, Gillen knows more about these things than any of us. And he told us to make sure we aren't spotted, all right? She muttered something. Horace was watching the two of them, his honest face troubled by the conflict between them. He offered a compromise. I could just make a small fire for cooking. If we build it under the bushes, the smoke should be pretty hard to see by the time it's full of through. It's not just that, Will explained, slinging their water bags over his shoulder and taking his bow from the saddle scabbard. The walkers have an amazing keener smell. If we did light a fire, the smell of the smoke would hang around for hours, after we'd put it out. Horace nodded, conceding the point. 
before anyone could raise any more objections, Will headed towards the jumble of rocks behind the campsite. I'm going to scout around, and see if there's any water in the area, and I'll just make sure we are alone. Ignoring the ghost, not that we've seen any all day, which was muttered just loud enough for him to hear. He began to scramble up the rocks. He made a careful circuit of the area, staying low and out of sight. Moving from cover to scan cover as carefully as he could. Whenever you're scouting, Holt had once said to him, move as if there's somebody there to see you. Never assume that you're on your own. He found no sign of walkers or the Celts, but he did come across a small clear stream that sluice cold water over a bit of rocks. It was running fast enough to look safe for drinking, so he tested it and satisfied that it wasn't polluted, filled the water bags to the brim. The cold fresh water tasted particularly good after the leathery tasting supplies from the bags. Once water had been in the water bag for more than a few hours, it began to taste like the bag and less like the water. Back at the campsite, Horace and Evelyn were waiting for his return. Evelyn had set out a plate of dried meat and the hot biscuit they had been eating in the place of bread for some time now. He was grateful that she also put a small amount of pickle on the meat. Any addition to the tasteless meal was welcome. He noticed as they were eating that there were none on her plate. Don't you like pickles? he asked through a mouthful of meat and biscuit. She shook her head, not meeting his eyes. Not really, she replied, but Horace wasn't prepared to let her rest at that. She gave the last of them to you, he told Will. For a moment, Will hesitated, embarrassed. He just mopped up the last small mouthful of the tangy yellow pickles in the corner of the biscuit and popped it into his mouth. There was no way now he could offer it to share. Oh, he mumbled, realizing that was her way of making the peace between them. Um, well, thanks, Evelyn. She tossed her head. With her close-cropped hair, the effect was a little wasted, and the thought struck him that she was probably used to making that gesture with long blunt locks that would accentuate the movement. I told you, I don't like pickles, she said. But now there was a hint of a grin in her voice, and the earlier bad humor was gone. He looked up at her and grinned in reply. I'll take the first watch, he finally said. He seemed as good a way as any of letting her know that he didn't hold a grudge. If you take the second watch as well, you can have my pickles too, offered Horace and they all laughed. The atmosphere in the little campsite lightened considerably as Horace and Evelyn busied themselves shaking out blankets and cloaks and gathering some of the leafier branches from the bushes around them to shave into beds. For his part, Will took one of the water bottles and his cloak and climbed up onto one of the larger rocks surrounding the camp. He settled himself as comfortably as possible with a clear view of the rocky hills behind them in one direction and over the bushes that screened them from the road in the other. Mindful as ever of Holt's teaching, he settled himself among a jumble of rocks that formed a more or less natural nest, allowing him to peer between them on either side without raising his head above the horizon level. He wriggled himself around for a few minutes, wishing there were not so many sharp stones to dig into. Then he struck, deciding that at least they stopped him from dozing off during his watch. He donned his cloak and raised the hood. As he sat there, unmoving among the grey rocks, he seemed to blend into the black background until he was almost invisible. It was the sound that first alerted him. It came and went vaguely with the breeze. As the breeze grew stronger, so did the sound. Then as the breeze faded, he could no longer hear anything, so that at first he thought he was just imagining things. Then it came again, a deep, rhythmic sound. Voices, perhaps, but not like any he had heard. It could have been singing, he thought. Then, as the breeze blew a little harder, he heard it again. It's not singing. There's no melody to it, just a rhythm. A constant, unvarying rhythm. Again the breeze died, and the sound with it. Will felt the hairs on the back of his neck rising. There was something unhealthy about that sound. Something dangerous. He sensed it in every fiber of his body. That was again. And this time he had it. Chanting. Deep voices chanting in unison. A tuneless chanting that had an unmistakable menace to it. The breeze was from the southwest. Though the sound was coming from the road where they had already traveled. He raised himself slowly and carefully peering under one hand in the direction of the breeze. From this point, he could make out various curves and bend in the road. 
although some of it disappeared behind the rocks and hills. He estimated that he could see sections of the road for perhaps a kilometer, and there was no sign of movement. Not yet, anyway. Quickly, he scrambled down from the rocks and hurried to wake the others. The changing was closer now. He no longer died away as the breeze came and went. It was growing louder and more defined. Will, Horace, and Evandin crouched among the bushes, listening to the voices as they came closer. Maybe you two should move back a little, Will suggested. He had left himself a relative clear view of the road. He knew that wrapped in his ranger cloak, with his face concealed deep within the cowl, he would be virtually invisible, but he wasn't so sure about the others. Without any reluctance, they squirmed back deeper into the cover of the thick shrubs. Horace's reaction was a mixture of curiosity and nervousness. Evelyn, Will noted, was pale with fear. They had already struck the cam and moved the horses back about a hundred meters into the rocks. He glanced around quickly, now to make sure they had left no sign of their presence. Satisfied that they had done all that they could, he turned his attention back to the road. Who are they? Horace breathed as the changing grew louder. Will estimated that it was coming from somewhere around the nearest bend in the road, a mere hundred meters away. Don't you know? Evelyn replied, her voice strained with terror. Th- they're walkers! Chapter 16 Will and Horace both turned quickly to look at her. Walkers? How do you know? Will asked. I've heard them before, she said in a small voice, biting her lip. Th- they make that chanting sound as they march. Will frowned. Four walkers he and Holt had tracked had made no chanting sound. But then he realized those walkers had been tracking their own quarry at the time. Out of the corner of his eye, Will saw movement at the bend on the road. Get down! He hissed urgently. Keep your faces down. And both Horace and Evelyn dropped their faces into the sand. He reached up and pulled in shadowy depths of his coat further over his own face, then held a forearm draped in the folds of his cloak to obscure everything but his eyes. The chant he saw now was a form of cadence designed to keep the walkers moving at the same pace, in the same way a sergeant might call the step for a troop of infantry. He counted perhaps thirty in the group, big Heavy set figures, dressed in dark metal studded jackets and breeches of some heavy material. They ran a steady jog, chanting the guttural wordless rhythm, which he realized now was nothing more than a series of grunts. They were all armed with an assortment of short spears, maces and battle axes, which they carried ready for use. As yet he couldn't make out their features. They ran with a shambling movement in two files. Then he realized and they were escorting another group between the two files, prisoners. Now that the group was closer, he realized that the prisoners, about a dozen of them, were staggering along, trying desperately to keep pace with the chaining walkers. He recognized them as Celts, miners judging by the leather aprons and skull caps. They were exhausted, and as he watched, he could see the walkers using short whips to urge them along. The chaining grew louder. What's happening? Was whisper and Will couldn't have cheerfully choked him. Shut up, he shot back. Not another word. Now the walkers were closer, and he could make out their faces. He felt the hairs on the back of his neck begin to rise as he saw the thick, heavy jowls and noses that had lengthened and thickened almost to the size of muscles. The eyes were small and savage, and seemed to glow with a red hatred as they lashed their whips at the Celts. As one of them snarled at a stumbling prisoner's, Will caught a quick glimpse of yellow fangs. He was tempted to shrink down further, but he knew any movement now would risk discovery. He had to trust the shelter of his cloak. He wanted to close his eyes to those animal-like faces, but somehow he couldn't. He stared in fascinated horror at the terrible walkers, creatures from the nightmare, chanting incessantly, jerked past as spot where he lay. The kelp miner couldn't have lost his footing at a worse place. Lashed by one of the walkers, he stumbled, staggered, then crashed over over in the road, bringing down the prisoners on either side of him. Will could see now that they were roped together with a thick rawhide leash. As the column came to a confused stop, the changing broke up into a series of snarls and growls from the walkers. The two prisoners, who had been brought down, struggled to their feet under a rain of lashes from their captors. The miner who had caused the fall lay still, in spite of the vicious whipping from one of the walkers. Finally, another joined the first and began beating at the still figure with the bob of his heavy, steel-shut spear. 
has no reaction from the miner. Watching in horror, Will realized that the man was dead. Eventually, the same realization came to the Wargals. In an incomprehensible command from one who must have been in charge, the two stopped beating the dead man and cut the bonds that attached him to the central leash. Then they picked up the limp body and threw it clear, hurling it towards the thicket where Will and the others sheltered. The body crashed into the bushes closest to the road, and Will heard Evan Lynn utter a small cry of fear, face down, not knowing what was happening. The sudden crashing into the bushes near her had obviously been too much for her to bear. She bit the noise off almost as soon as it started, but she was just a little too late. The leader of the walkers seemed to have heard something. He turned now and stared hard at the spot where the body lay, wondering if the noise had come from the miner. Obviously he was suspecting that the dead man might be merely foxing in an effort to escape. He pointed and shouted in order and the walker with the spear stepped forward and ran it casually through the dead body. Still the commander's suspicions weren't satisfied. For a long moment he stared into the bushes, looking straight at the spot where Will lay. The apprentice found himself staring deep into the angry eyes of the savage thing on the road. He wanted to drop his eyes away from the gaze, convinced that the creature could see him, but all of Holt's training over the past year told him that any movement now would be fatal, and he knew that dropping his eyes could lead to a tiny involuntary movement of his head. The true value of the camouflage cloaks lay not in magic as so many people believed, but in the wearer's ability to remain unmoving under close scrutiny. Forcing himself to believe, Will remained motionless, staring at the walker. His mouth was dry. His heart pounded at what seemed like twice its normal rate. He could hear the heavy rasping breathing of the bear-like figure as the nostrils, twitching slightly as it sampled the light breeze testing for unknown scents. Finally, the walker turned away. Then in an instant it went back again to stare once more. Fortunately, Will's training had covered that particular trick as well. He made no movement. This time the walker grunted, then called an order to the group. Changing once more, they moved out, leaving the dead mine on the roadside. As the sound receded and they disappeared around the next bend in the road, Will felt horrors moving behind him. Stay still, he whispered fiercely. It was possible that the walkers had a sweeper following a silent moving rear scout who might catch unvary fugitive who thought the danger were past. He forced himself to count to 100 before he allowed the others to move, calling clear of the bushes and stretching the stiff, stiff and arcing limbs. Signaling to Horace to take Evelyn back to the campsite, Will stepped cautiously into the road to check the Celt. As he had suspected, the man was dead. He had obviously been beaten many times over the past few days. His face was bruised and cut by the whips and fitting fists of the walkers. There was nothing he could do for the man, so he left him where he lay and went to rejoin the others. Evelyn was sitting crying. As he approached, she fall- looked up at him, her face streaked with tears and her shoulders heaving with the great sobs that shook her. Horace stood by, a helpless expression on his face, making useless little movement with his hands. But I'm sorry, Evelyn finally managed to grasp. It's just that ch- chanting, th- those voices. I-, I could hear everything when they... It- it's all right, Will told her quietly. My god, they are horrible creatures, he added, shaking his head at Horace. The warrior apprentice swallowed once or twice. He hadn't seen the walkers. He'd lain there for the entire encounter with his face pressed hard into the sturdy ground. In a way, thought Will, that must have been just as terrifying. What are they like? Horace asked in a small voice. Will shook his head again. It was almost impossible to describe. Like beasts, he said. Like bears. A cross between a bear and a dog. But they walk upright like men. Even he gave another swollen cry. They're vile, she said bitterly. Vile, horrible creatures. God, I hope I never see them again. Will moved to her and patted her shoulder awkwardly. They're gone now said quietly as if soothing a small child. They're gone and they can't hurt you. She made an enormous effort and gathered her courage. She looked up at him, a frightened smile on her face. She reached up and took his hand in her own, taking comfort from the mere contact. He let her hold his hand for a while. He wondered 
how he was going to tell them what he had decided to do. Chapter 17 Follow them? Are you out of your mind? Horace stared at the small, determined figure, unable to believe what he was hearing. Will didn't say anything, so Horace tried again. Will, we just spent half an hour hiding behind a bush, hoping those things wouldn't see us. Now you want to follow them and give them another chance? Will glanced around to make sure that Evan Lim was still out of earshot. He didn't want to alarm the girl unnecessarily. Keep your voice down, he warned Horace. And his friend spoke more softly, but none less vehemently. Why? What can we possibly gain by following them? Will shifted uneasily from one foot to the other. Frankly, the idea of following the walkers was already frightening him. He could feel his pulse rate was running higher than normal. They were terrifying creatures and obviously totally devoid of any feelings of mercy or pity, as the fate of the prisoners had shown. Still, he could see that this was an opportunity that shouldn't be wasted. Look, he said quietly, Holt always told me that knowing why your enemy is doing something is just as important as knowing what he's doing, sometimes more important, in fact. Horace shook his head stubbornly. I don't get it, he said. To him, this idea of Will's was a crazy, irresponsible, and terrifyingly dangerous impulse. To be truthful, Will wasn't abs absolutely sure that he was right either, but Gillen's parting words about not showing uncertainty rang in his ears, and his instincts, honed by Hall's training, told him there was an opportunity he shouldn't miss. We know that the walkers are capturing Celtic miners and carrying them off, he said, and we know Morgrav doesn't do anything without a reason. This might be a chance to find out what he's up to. Horace shrugged. He wants slaves, he said, and Will shook his head quickly. But why? And why only miners? Emmeline said they were only interested in the miners. Why? Can't you see? He appealed to the bigger boy. This could be important. Hall says that we was often turn on to the smallest piece of information. Horace pursed his lips, thinking of what Will had said. Finally, he nodded slowly. All right. He agreed. Guess you may be right. Horace wasn't a fast thinker, or an original one, but he was mythological, and his own way, logical. Will had instinctively seen the necessity for following the walkers. Horace had to work his way through it. Now that he had, he could see Will wasn't acting on some wild and venturous impulse. He trusted the ranger's apprentice line of reasoning. Well, if we're going to follow them, we'd better get moving, he added. And Will looked at him in surprise, shaking his head. We? He said. Who said anything about we? I plan to follow them alone. Your job is to get Evelyn back safely. Says who? Asked the bigger boy with some belligerence. My job, as it was explained to me by Gillen, was to stay with you and keep you out of trouble. Well, I'm changing your orders, Will told him. But Horace just laughed. So who died and left you the bus? You can't change my orders. Gillen gave me those orders, and he outranks you. And what about the girl? Will challenged him. For a moment, Horace was struck for an answer. We'll give her food and supplies and the pack horse, he said. She can make her own way back. It's very gallant of you, Will said sarcastically. Horace merely shook his head again, refusing to be baited into an argument on that score. You're the one who said this is so darn important, he replied. Well, I'm afraid I think you're right. So Evelyn will simply have to take her chances, just like us. We're close to the border now anyway, and one more night's riding will see her out of Celtica. In truth, Horace didn't like the thought of leaving Evelyn to herself. He'd grown genuinely fond of the girl. She was bright and amusing and good company. But his time in battle school had given him strong sense of duty, and personal feelings came second. We'll try it one more time. I can move a lot faster without you, he pointed out. But Horace cut him off immediately. So what? We won't need speed if we're following the war goals. We've got horses. We'll have no trouble keeping up with them, particularly as they have to drag those prisoners along. He found he was rather enjoying the experience of arguing with Will and coming up with winning points. Maybe, he decided, spending time with the rangers had done more good than he realized. Besides, what if we find out something really important? And what if you want to keep following them? And we still have to get a message back to the Baron. If there are two of us, we can split up. I can take the message back while you keep following the war goals. Will considered the idea. Horace had a point, he had to concede. 
It would make sense to have someone else along with him, now that he thought about it. All right, he said finally. But we're going to have to tell Evelyn. Tell me what? The girl asked. Unnoticed by either of them, she had approached to within a few meters of where they'd been standing, arguing in lowered voices. The two boys now looked guilty at each other. Uh, Will had this idea, you, you see... Horace began, then stopped, looking at Will, to see if his friend was going to continue. But as it turned out, there was no need. You're planning to follow the war girls, the girl said flatly, and the two apprentices exchanged looks before Will answered. You were listening? he accused her. She shook her head. No, it's obvious thing to do, isn't it? This is our chance to find out what they're up to, and why they're kidnapping their miners. For the second time in a few minutes, Will found himself picking up on the use of the plural. Our chance? he asked her. What exactly do you mean by our chance? Emmeline shrugged. Obviously, if you two are following them, I'm coming along with you. You're not leaving me out here on my own in the middle of nowhere. But, but, Horace began, and she turned to look calmly at him. These are war girls, he said. I kind of figured that. Horace cast a hopeless glance at Will. The apprentice ranger shrugged, so Horace tried again. It'll be dangerous, and you... He hesitated. He didn't want to remind her of her fear of the war girls and the reasons for it. Evelyn realized his predicament, and she smiled vainly at him. Look, I'm scared of those things, but I assume you're planning to follow them and not join up with them. That was the general idea, Will said, and she turned her level gaze on him. Well, with the noise they make, we shouldn't have to get too close to them, she told him. And besides, this might be a chance to spoil whatever plans they have. I think I'd enjoy that. Will regarded her with a new respect. She had every reason to fear the Woggles more than he or Horace, yet she was willing to put that fear aside in order to strike a blow against Morgoroth. You sure? he said finally, and she shook her head. No, I'm not sure at all. I feel decidedly creased at the prospect of getting within earshot of those things again. But equally, I don't like the idea of being abandoned here on my own. We, we weren't abandoning you, Horace began, and she turned back to him. Then what would you call it? She asked him, smiling faintly to take the sting out of her words. He hesitated. Uh, abandoning you, I guess, he admitted. Exactly, she said. So, given the choice of running into another group of vogels or more bandits, or following some vogels with you two, I'll choose the latter. We're only a day away from the border, Will pointed out to her. Once you cross that, you'll be relatively safe. But she shook her head decisively. I feel more secure with you two. Besides, it might be handy for you to have someone else along. It'll be one more person to keep watch at night. It means you'll get more sleep. That's the first sensible reason I've heard for her coming so far, said Horace. Like Will, he realized that she'd made her mind. And both boys somehow knew that when Evelyn did that, there was no way to on earth they were going to make her change it. She grinned at them. Well, are we going to stand here all day nattering? Those war girls aren't getting any closer while we're doing it, she said. And turning on her heel, she led the way to where the horse switches out.